Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the afternoon session of the Africa Business Conference here at HPS, with a special welcome to Dean Noria, who is with us today. It's a great honor to be introducing our keynote speaker this afternoon, Mr. Richard Attias, founder and CEO of the New York Forum. After a degree in civil engineering and a childhood in his native Morocco and two years at ABM, Richard quickly decided that his true calling was to be an entrepreneurship. A global 20-year career thus far has taken him from being executive producer of the World Economic Forum in Davos, being the co-founder of the Clinton Global Initiative and the initiator of the Nobel Laureate Conference to his position today as inventor, chairman, producer and CEO of the New York Forum. Driven by a deep belief that the world is in an inflection point, with the West in deep trouble, Richard sees huge opportunity for the African continent, but is also mindful of the fact that for that opportunity to be harnessed, it needs to be extended to the continent's youth. In that function, he has thought up the New York Forum for Africa which this year will take place for the first time in Gabon in June as a call to action for politicians, business leaders, and the continent's youth. He's also launching the Global Food Security Summit in his native Morocco next week. Richard will be speaking today to HBS's own Professor Catherine Duggan, inofficially known as Miss Africa here on campus. <laughs> She lectures in the Business, Government and the International Economy Unit, researches widely on issues of microfinance and financial regulations in uh, emerging markets with a special focus on Africa, has lived for two years in Uganda and published widely, including two cases at HPS on Uganda and Nigeria. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome with me Mr. Richard Attias and Catherine Duggan. Mr. Artias, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you for the invitation, and I, I really would like to thank the Africa Business Club because what they are doing is quite amazing. And uh, as an event organizer, I can tell that I'm already very impressed by the job they are doing, and I would like to thank Cornelius, but also Cher and Michael, who were really great about our presence here. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much. So I wanted to start by asking you a little bit about your background. You have a very interesting background moving from civil engineering degrees and math and physics degrees to putting together these organizations which bring together people to talk about these difficult world issues. Could you tell me a little bit about your decision to move into this new... You know, first of all, I think uh, I was always passionate by people. Uh, when I was four years old, uh, I remember a, an anecdote. I was in Morocco on the beach with my parents, and they disappeared. So they were panicking. And in fact, I went just to connect with uh, a guy who was a little bit uh, far with his boat, because I wanted to have the point to have a boat tour with him. So I was always passionate by people. I think that the key asset of our planet is people. So this is why after dealing with computers, which is quite boring, it was before the internet bubble, so I missed the internet bubble. Um, so I think, okay, what can I do? So I decided definitely to put people together, to bring content. I think this is key, content, content. And uh, I don't know other thing than a dialogue to solve issues and to make people progressing and looking ahead. So I built the business around that. And you've decided to move the New York Forum to Gabon this year. Could you tell me a little bit about that decision? Yes. First of all, the New York Forum, I would like just to say a few words about the DNA of the New York Forum. In fact, uh, after producing Davos for 15 years, I came to the conclusion that um, we need to focus more on uh, business. Uh, Davos is an amazing platform, but it's talking about all issues in the world and a lot of political issues. And after the 2008 economic crisis, we considered with my wife that we should definitely start something from the place where the crisis started, New York. I was fascinated by the DNA of New York, the resilience of New York, 
uh, just after September 11, when I moved Davos to New York. And I decided that we should put together a voice which was missing, the business community voice. After the crisis, until now, we are blaming too often the business leaders. And nothing can be done in the world without the business community. This has to be absolutely <laughs> understood. Based on that, we started the New York Forum as a call to action. A call to action, two days and a half, focusing on the major issues that the global economy is facing. And we don't leave a room without an action plan, without a roadmap, without a solution. So the first two editions of the New York Forum, we had the great pleasure to host uh, people from all continents except Africa. Why? Only few Africans. Because first of all, it's very difficult to get a visa to come to the United States. <laughs> Two, it's very expensive to fly from Africa to America. And the huge paradox, and this will be a, a key issue about the global integration, is when you want to go to Lib from Libreville to New York, you have to go to Paris, which is another paradox. So my commitment was to do something in Africa. And where in Africa, uh, when you talk about Africa, everybody is thinking South Africa and Nigeria. South Africa and Nigeria, great countries. But this is not only Africa. <laughs> <laughs> so, of course, I thought about going to Morocco, but then I would say, oh my god, native country, you are too much, and you are not objective. Forgive me, Your Excellency, my dear friend, the ambassador of Morocco to you, and he's here. So I say, okay, I want to go in a country which first has a great potential, two great people, because I'm very effective and I just want to deal with people who I like and who I love. Because when you, greet, when you give your, your energy to some people, you need to be really in total confidence. Three, a country which is stable. And you know, you don't have so many countries in Africa which are quite stable. Excellent transition after uh, the late uh, President Omar Bongo passed away. So all of this component, plus the fact that, uh, and I know she doesn't like to be mentioned, but Her Excellency Mrs. Pascaline Bongo, who is uh, here, and I would like to thank her, really. She is the president of the foundation, <laughs> and, and she is one of the very few person I know who care about her country and about the continent. So we had a, an open conversation, and she told me, Richard, I would like to organize an economic conference in Africa. I said, okay, let's do something together. And uh, this will be the first ever conference which will be for Africa, about Africa, and owned by Africans. So I think this is very important, and this is why we expect a lot from that conference. And I think Gabon is a very well located, huge potential on many areas, from natural resources to tourism, from uh, potentiality in, uh, in industry services, and also uh, what they call the Green Gabon, which include a lot of other opportunities. And I think that this business model could be duplicated to all the continent. So, and we are very happy to go to Gabon in three months, and we hope that we will welcome uh, many of you, including you, Professor. Thank you. So, one of the things that we hear about, and we've heard a lot today, is the idea that government needs to do something. This is something we hear over and over, and yet you talked about the importance of the private sector for pushing things forward economically. How do you see those two things fitting together in Africa? Oh, first of all, I think that the private sector should take its destiny in its hands. We should stop to always wait for governments, for leaders, for political leaders to make decisions and to babysit us. No way. They don't have all the solutions to everything. I'm a strong believer on public-private partnerships. Point number one. Point number two, I think that today the NGOs, the uh, private sector and the government should work together on all issues. Uh, just after the New York Forum, the day after the New York Forum for Africa, my wife is hosting Dialogue for Action in partnership with the First Lady Foundation in Gabon about women issues. It's only about women issues. And when we prepare the program, when she's working on the program, she sees how important is the role of the private sector, of the NGOs to empower women, to put some action plan on healthcare solutions, on education, on even uh, not just empowering women, but also the role that women from the civil society are playing in conflict on during 
uh, when the country are in, in, in war. Uh, and it's not by coincidence that Africa is the only continent which has two Nobel Prize, Peace Nobel Prize, who are women and who are from Liberia. So definitely I'm a strong believer on the fact that the private sector has a lot of power, uh, should activate this power. I'm a strong believer that the future is in the hands of the small and medium-sized companies. And I hope that many of these great minds will not just go to Goldman Sachs or McKinsey, or, but they will also uh, work for some small, medium-sized projects because this is where the future is and this is where they can make a lot of money. And so how can small and medium-sized enterprises be... How can they be particularly effective in, in making this wedge that we heard about this morning, in allowing them to do the business that they need to do in sometimes very challenging circumstances? Okay, so I think when we look at the global economic crisis, um, let's forget Africa for two minutes and let's go to Europe. Um, Europe was a great concept. I even produced the launch of the Euro money, uh, which is not in good health today, as you know. Uh, and the way the system is working today is, and all political leaders trying to find solutions about the debt in Greece, Portugal, Spain, etc., is putting a little bit on the side the private sector. Uh, it's not the political leaders who will create jobs. No way. If they don't have a real dialogue with the private sector, nothing will happen. Nothing will happen. Uh, if you ask me what uh, should I have to recruit people tomorrow, definitely we need some tax exemptions. We need many, many, I would say, uh, um, decisions which ha has to be made by political leaders, but on the suggestion on the private sector. And this is also another aspect of the DNA of the New York Forum, because after these discussions, we are going to the G20 and we are presenting to the leaders, the political leaders, it will be in Los Cabos in, in Mexico, the proposals which will came from the discussions. So to uh, reduce the gap, back to your question, I think this should happen be, uh, through a dialogue. And one suggestion I'm making, by the way, to your amazing uh, forum, will be that next year you should, number one, have a little bit more political leaders. Don't give them too much of the floor, because after the media and the attention will go only to them. But some sessions should definitely involve. I was attending two panels this morning, including the one on entertainment. And I was, I was listening very carefully to the great uh, film producer from Nigeria, who was explaining how difficult it was even to bring uh, five camera in Nigeria. So if you want to develop an entertainment, a media, a movie industry in some countries, the political leaders should absolutely be realistic. And this is, by the way, something that we did very well in Morocco. I have to say that the communication between the private sector and the uh, government is so close that bringing also some people from the private sector, becoming ministers for a few years helped a lot to change some rules and to change and, and to make them becoming policy makers. So I think we should have much more private sector leaders going to public affairs and vice versa. Fantastic. Now you brought up Europe and this is all about regional integration in Africa, but of course we're seeing some efforts at regional integration in other regions falling apart or at least on shaky ground. What do you see as the ideal for regional integration in Africa? You know, um, I'm not a strong believer on regional integration. Let me be very honest. I think it's a fabulous dream, but it's still a dream. <laughs> so let's be very honest. Um, uh, to have, of course, unity is fabulous. Uh, living all together as brothers, sisters in the ideal world is great. But this will never happen. Let's be absolutely realistic. Why? Why it will never happen, and then after we go back to some other regions. It will never happen, first, because political leaders have all big egos. You cannot be a political leader if you don't have a big ego. Like, you cannot be a big CEO if you don't have a big ego, by definition. So how will I accept to lose my power by becoming one of a big region instead of being my small king in my small kingdom? No, it's, so point number one, a huge difficulty. 
I cannot mention, but maybe during the conversation, we will come about all the things which has to move, to be removed, to be pushed, uh, to, uh, bring some, to, to break some borders, and to have the, at least the minimum of integration, because you cannot uh, ignore integration, um, uh, sorry, regional integration, and not putting uh, opposite to opposite that to globalization. So back to the region. Definitely, and why I am a little bit pessimistic? Because in the past 20 years, I think I produced at least 20 conferences about regions. I did five economic conferences on Mercosur. Why Mercosur is not working? Because you have Brazil, huge heavyweight, and the others. Brazil do not want to help the others. Everybody is dying to do business in Brazil, but there is no reciprocity. So you have Brazil from one side, who is like a huge heavyweight. Now Argentina is a little bit coming back. But you have other countries who are growing, growing, but not in the way of a global integration. Colombia is doing well. Uh, Chile is doing well. But definitely, if today you ask this young uh, gentleman and, and, and uh, woman to say, OK, if you have to move to Latin America, where will you go? Brazil. Not only because it's the World Cup coming soon, but because definitely it is, it is definitely the country which attracts the most. Same in uh, the APEC. We produced a few weeks ago the APEC conference in Honolulu, Hawaii. President Obama was there. President of China was there. But I was in the audience sitting next to my wife. I said, OK, these people will never be aligned. Never be aligned. It's a big region. The only thing they did. It, was, it happened a few weeks ago. They give now, you have a pass if you have a member of the APEC. Great, in GFK or in other airports, you have your own line, which is saving you two, three hours, which is a good thing, by the way. <laughs> so at least this is the beginning of a process of an integration. But you will never have Chinese leaders being aligned 100% with Americans or even with Indonesians. So this is why I'm a little bit skeptical. And in Europe, my god, we see what is happening. It's so difficult. No, and it's pity because you know the problem in Europe, how to make uh, so many countries being aligned when you have so many languages also. Okay, it's just the first difficulty is the language. And as you know, and you see with my broken English in France, we are very bad with learning languages. So uh, it's quite difficult to find even a common language between European countries. So this is why it's more easy sometimes to do business between France and Africa than between France and Spain, which is just next door, because uh, of the language uh, problem. So having said that, we cannot be absolutely pessimistic, because what globalization and also integration is, first of all, globalization it's a process which is not reversible. This is not negotiable anymore. Globalization, it's now the new world where we are living. And why? Because technology. Technology is everywhere. Technology is helping to share knowledge. Technology is helping to share uh, uh, goods. Uh, technology is helping to uh, share and to transfer money in a second. So we are living in a global world. And some presidential candidate for some presidential campaign even in Europe are against globalization, I think it's a nonsense. So now in the process of globalization, how Africa and how integra and regional integration can play a role. I think second, very humble advice, to have a good integration in the global world next year, but maybe uh, Mr. Dean, you have to extend your fabulous uh, uh, amphitheater. It would be great to have at least 50% of the audience non-African. Because you cannot talk about Africa in the global world if you don't invite more people and not just African. You need to give the will and the wish to people to discover, to know what is Africa today. And not because IMF. <laughs> and this is one of the goals that we have with Mrs. Bongo about this this New York Forum Africa. We want people to come to Africa. And it is thanks to the foundation, again, that it's, it's by invitation, but it's a complimentary, which is the only forum which is complimentary. No fees, no registration fees, which is quite unique. And this is how, definitely, you help 
people and you motivate people to come to Africa. So uh, definitely I think uh, about the regional integration, you need to fight against difference of cultures, difference of values, a difference of attitude. Uh, and this is why it's quite challenging. So insofar as one has to focus on one thing, do you think that Africa should be focusing inward or outward in adapting to the new global world? First of all, I think African countries individually should now raise the bar in each country. Good governance, more transparency, this is very important. I will not invest in a country if I'm a little bit scared about what will happen in that country in the next few days. Uh, I'm telling you, even in Morocco, which is a fabulous kingdom, the minute the king, his majesty the king, decided to anticipate with a new constitution, I know, and I was so sad to see that many investors, they stopped for a few months. Oh, my God, something is happening. So we don't move. Let's see what will be the government. Oh, maybe the Islamists. Oh, my God, what will happen to us? Let's sell our house that we have in Marrakesh. Now, this is a reality. <laughs> you don't find a lot of courageous investors, believe me. So, first of all, we need to stabilize the country. We need to send strong message, and this is where communication is key. Uh, not because I am in the field of communication, but we need to communicate more. A country has a brand. A country is a brand, by definition today. A country is a brand. So we need to understand back to the roots, back to the DNA, what the country is about. And then when you send strong message about who you are, uh, how stable you are, what is your vision, what is your strategy, then you can open to the region, neighbors. Uh, but you have always to hope that your neighbors are doing the same thing than you. How can you open the borders when you know that next door in the Sahel you have terrorists, you have Al-Qaeda, and you are potentially someone who will destabilize your own country? So security is key in Africa, and this is one of the key topics that we will have in one of our panel. Good governance and security are the two pillars to absolutely focus on for the political leaders. And then after, when you stabilize the region, when you also raise the education level. Because if you have two countries, one doing very well, having great education system, and one very poor education system, what will happen the minute you open the border, you have no more visa. Everybody would like to go and to study in the next country. And this is what's why today it's quite difficult to have these people coming back to the country. Because when you have the privilege to study in Harvard Business School. What will motivate you to come back? What will motivate you to come back? You need to be very attached to your country, strong roots. You need to be sure that your political leaders will build an environment, an ecosystem, which will help you to create, to innovate, to be happy. I think very, and to live in a safe world with your family, to raise your kids in a good education system with a good health system. And you know, I'm an engineer, as you, as you said, so I always see very pragmatic and basic answers when we have issues. So let's fix these issues. Um, I'm not a communist, but I have to say that you, if, despite the big economic crisis, you have huge elephant in the private sector who are making billions of dollars of profit in the energy system, in the energy industry, in other industries. I think we should have, as a big elephant, a, a commitment to when you make one, two, three billion dollar of profit. Let's give just 5%, 50 million, 100 million. It's nothing for them. It's a lot for a country to invest in education or in health care. Because governments do not have any more money. They, all countries are under the water with debts. So the solution, if we want to continue to have our planet going from 7 billion to 10 billion people, which will happen very soon, the private sector has to do something. It's a non-choice. So this is what I think should be done to start to build. Uh, uh, before building uh, you know, a house, you need to have very stable foundations. So before building the, inter the regional integration, each component of the region should be stabilized, should be secured, should have good education system, good healthcare system, and then we will see how we, what we can do together. Because I, had, I was discussing with my friend, the ambassador, and you know, it's quite funny, I was telling, tell me, in fact, 
about regional integration. ECOWAS, SADEC, COMESA, IMU, ECCAS, CNASED, EAC, IGAD, and I continue like that. These are all the organizations which are existing in Africa since years, and frankly speaking, I don't know what they are doing. <laughs> so let me ask you about a timing issue then. So you mentioned, I think it's correct, that people need to feel as though they're going to be able to make a life for themselves in order to go back. And yet, you also talked about the fact that it's those people who are going to make a change, or at least some of those people are going to be the ones to make a change. So how do we get over this timing problem and make sure that people go back even before things are stable, even before things are easy? OK, so let's now speak about the optimistic Richard. Um, I am really very optimistic. Why? Because definitely I see a huge change on leadership. First of all, the world is lacking of leadership. There is a big lack of leadership. Everywhere, everywhere. And I think that part of the economic crisis was a leadership crisis. But why I was very happy to come here, because I think, and it's not to flatter them, I think that the future of Africa, like the future of the world, uh, is by definition in schools like your school. Let's be, okay? Uh, it's not because we have a world of elite and a world without elite, it's because when you are well educated, open to the world, sharing every day, um, your day-to-day -day activities with Indians, with Chinese, with Europeans, with Africans, with Latin Americans, by definition, you are becoming a citizen of the world. And this is why I'm very happy doing this job, because for 20 years, I became a citizen of the world, a connector and a global influencer. And I think this is the most passionate thing that you can do in the world. So by saying that, I think I see a transition on leadership in Africa. I think the next 10 years, you will see many new leaders. President Ali Bongo is one of them. He, of course, he has a heritage of 40 plus years in his country, but it was not the same time. He just appointed a new government a few days ago with new ministers, and I think, I don't know what will happen in Senegal in a few days, but the transition started. Whatever will happen, the transition started. And we can continue to list many countries. We saw how difficult it was to make a transition in Ivory Coast. We see what is happening in Nigeria, we have to solve to fix what is happening in there, et cetera, et cetera. So first, first uh, uh, I would say, uh, component, we are looking, we are watching a transition of leadership. If on the top of this political transition of leadership, we bring new leaders from the private sector with new methods, no corruption. You know, you make, we were last week in Atlanta meeting with a great US figure, the ambassador Andrew Young, who is a lover of Africa. He was a former ambassador, US ambassador to the UN, and he knows Africa, I think, better than all of us. It's amazing the way he described Africa, the way he has a vision of Africa. And he told us, you know, people have to realize in Africa, like in many other countries, that you can make much more money if you do real business in total transparency than trying to make business with commissions under the table. And this is absolutely true. So I hope that new methods, new ethics, and I know that you have even lessons on ethics in universities like yours, I think with bringing more leaders from the private sectors, uh, the new generations, plus new political leaders, definitely we will see a huge change in the countries. When at the same time you have a continent with 6% of growth, by definition, population, natural resources, better now infrastructures, etc., the future is yours. The future is definitely yours. This is why I, I, I'm very optimistic on the future of Africa. It will not happen in a minute. It's not magic. But there is a fabulous window of opportunity. With the United States being a little bit slow economy, as you know, paralyzed by a presidential campaign, having Europe in trouble, let's say that uh, like this, having China starting to be a little bit, you know, uh, has to manage the consequence of two-digit growth for the past 10 years, Africa has definitely a huge opportunity to take, and you should not miss that opportunity. Definitely you should not. You should take and learn lessons from the past 
It's exactly the same thing which happened with technology. Africa was far behind when computer internet started. And by not being in the global map, the minute they started, the minute countries start to be computerized, to have internet, boom, they jump a generation, and now they are exactly at the same level of other countries or continents. I think what will happen also in, uh, in integration uh, in the global economy will be the same. Africa was a little bit behind. Now everybody is looking at, at Africa. So this is a fabulous opportunity to jump in humility, not being arrogant, to be absolutely, um, uh, I would say, realistic on the fact that when you have Chinese coming, when you have Europe coming, what you need to balance your partnership. I think it's very important. A country cannot be owned by another country. This is absolutely key. And, uh, and uh, even if I have a lot of respect for China, a lot of respect for Qatar, these countries who are very powerful today because they have a lot of cash and cash is king, they cannot buy countries. Okay? So I think political leaders and the private sector should have also this, I would say, moral, moral commitment to be sure that they will well balance their partnership. And so can I ask you, what opportunities do you see? You talked about SMEs. Do you have sectoral opportunities that you see as being something that Everywhere. people need to go into? Everywhere. Uh, back to Gabon also, why I want to go to Gabon, because the, the, the business plan of Gabon is very simple. It is what they call the manufacturing Gabon, the Gabon of services, and the green Gabon. These three pillars, I think, could be duplicated everywhere in Africa. Green. Definitely a huge opportunities in new energy, in green energy, but also in tourism. Tourism is huge potential. I can tell you again, not to, to, to talk again about my native country, but this is one of the model, like South Africa, the two opposite countries of the continent, about tourism. Uh, it was the vision of His Majesty the King Mohammed VI. Um, the plan was to have 10 million tourists by 2010, the plan was achieved, and now the next plan is 20 million by 2020. How? To do that, it's quite simple, you know. You just have to, to, to stick on your goals. Infra you need to improve your infrastructures. You have to build airports. Okay, you don't have money to build airports? Let's find partnerships. Okay, and let's find countries, investors who will be happy to build an airport, and then you make a deal, 20, 50, 60 years deal with them, they will have the profit of the, uh, I would say, running the airport and the license to run it, but let's improve your airport, because it's a nonsense to have 50 fabulous five-star hotels and no airport. <laughs> no, but this is the case in, in Turks and Caicos, for example. You know, Turks and Caicos, we went with my wife last year, Fabulous island in the Caribbean, fabulous hotels, but the airport is like in the 1920. <laughs> so it's a huge paradox. So tourism is huge niche, big niche, infrastructures, um, hotels, and not only five stars. You need to have hotels also for a local market and the regional market. The regional tourism will be a fabulous opportunity for each country in Africa. Instead of having people from Ivory Coast or from South Africa or from Nigeria going always to London or to, to, to Spain, they should spend the honeymoon in the region. <laughs> yes, you know, you have fabulous, you, you, you have fabulous, fabulous landscape. So it's a huge paradox to see people coming, flying 15 hours to see gorilla in Rwanda. And, <laughs> And, and you are next door, and you don't even uh, make the effort to go to see or to visit Rwanda. Maybe visa issue. This is also another problem of regional integration, because you need also to open the borders. So um, tourism is one. Energy, definitely, but new energy. I think that, you know, I was speaking a few weeks ago with the former minister of environment in France. And he is also a strong supporter of Africa. And he told me, you know, I presented a plan a few years ago to the UN with $50 billion, $50 billion, which is a big amount, but it's nothing, because we're talking about $10 billion on five years. Africa, Africa can become self-sufficient on energy by building a plan 
which will uh, definitely start to have infrastructures mixing the um, solar energy, the uh, wind energy, and in some countries, in some region, which will help other countries in the region, to start partnership on civil nuclear energy. So when you think about that, you say, OK, why it's not happening? So definitely opportunities in energy, opportunity in tourism, opportunities in all services, telecom by definition. So in all areas, you have opportunities, really, in all areas. Fantastic. Thank you. So we're going to open this up to questions. I believe that there are mics down here. Um, and I'll ask you to keep your question to a single question and not to make statements about, we're, we're very interested in what you think, but we're going to try and get as many people able to ask questions as we possibly can. So if you'd like to come down and direct questions at microphones, that would be terrific. Go ahead. Uh, my name is Kofi. And first of all, I think it would be very hard not to make a statement, but I'll try not to make any. any. Um, so today we have heard of the same country over and over, which makes sense, South Africa, Nigeria, Kenya. We have not heard a word about the French-speaking country. I'm from the French side. And it totally makes sense why the French part is highly fragmented. So you are truly a global leader. And I want to know what are some of the, re the re uh, reason of the fragment of African, of the French part? And there's no better person to ask that question. Being a global leader, and you are currently married to the for former first lady of France, so you understand. <laughs> so you truly, so you okay. truly understand both parts. So I, have, I have an opinion. You know, I want you to also mention. So his his question is about Frank. His question the is about French. France. Yeah, it's basically how how is it that France and the francophone countries can integrate? So thank you, thank okay. you very much for your question. So, so I'm going to parse this question and and ask how is it that francophone countries can integrate? We've we've heard a lot about South Africa and a lot about Nigeria and a lot about some of these other anglophone countries. What about French speaking countries? Okay, so uh, first of all, I think that the fact that we are hosting the New York Forum Africa in Gabon is part of the answer. Uh, because it would be even more easy for me to again organize this conference in Ethiopia or in uh, Nigeria or in South Africa. No, we made the courageous decision to go to a French-speaking country. But to answer to your question, first of all, to have a better integration of the French-speaking countries is to cut a little bit the link with France. <laughs> you know, I'm not a fan of, psych of uh, what you call that, the uh, uh, psychotherapy. But you always say that one day in your life, to become a real adult, you need to kill the link you have with your mother. So I think this doesn't mean that you should ignore France as a partner. But you should think more global. And this is what I was saying. You should have a more balanced partnership. So this is the only way. The second way, we need to be realistic. We need to learn English. <laughs> and maybe soon, and maybe soon Mandarin. <laughs> OK. Thank you. Do we have other questions? We have a question coming down here. If you'd like to ask questions, could you please come down and you can make a line near the microphone so that we can make sure that we have questions coming. Hi, everyone. I'm, um, thank you very much for coming. I don't have a question. I just uh, heard something that I'm really disappointed about. So, so can you please pose it as a question? OK. <laughs> My question, if it's a question, is whoever he's with is his personal life. We're here for business. That's all. <laughs> all right, so, so let, me, let me then parse this and ask. No, no, let me, let, me, let me ask this question. There's an interesting question that people like to ask, especially when we think about returning to the continent, which is people have personal issues to balance. It is, in many cases, more difficult. You mentioned this. It's difficult to raise families. It's difficult to have school, children in school. How is it that people who are interested in going to the continent and living in what's some, in some cases challenging circumstances, 
How do you balance this personal with the professional? Uh, I think this has nothing to do just with Africa. Uh, it's very difficult, by the way, to balance uh, today uh, private life and business life. And this is even worse for, for women because they have three lives. In addition of being a mother and being a businesswoman, they have also to be uh, a, a wife, so which is not easy. Um, I think today the problem is, again, back to private public partnership. Each country should have laws, uh, should implement tools to help mothers to raise the kids and working at the same time, should help also to find, to create what we call, uh, I don't know the word in English, but in France we call that les emplois de proximité, so jobs of proximity jobs, where you can, you know, I'm always surprised not to see in all countries, you know, uh, more easy access to jobs where you can find a nanny, where you can find the help at home, etc. Especially in Africa, the culture is to keep everybody in the same house. The grandmother, the grandpa, you know, we don't have the culture of going to have the grandparents retiring in the retirement house. We need to keep all this. So to do that, governments, NGOs, private sector should work together to build an ecosystem which will help, you know, it's really, and it's not just here. I see my, my, uh, my stepdaughter and her husband, who by the way are, is in Harvard Business School. Uh, it's not easy, I see, that they manage their two kids, even here in Boston, uh, for her to go to the hospital at 6 a.m. in the morning when she's working and studying at the same time. And so it's everywhere. Uh, and this is, I think, the duty of governments and private sectors to work together to find solutions because if we want to have great talents who are happy at home and happy at work, we need definitely to build the ecosystem by itself. But maybe my wife will be much more qualified to answer to that question because I know that she worked on that for 20 years when she was in politics. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you for coming. I am very privileged to uh, see you in person. I, I really like what you're doing in the world, briefly. My question, is, um, <laughs> my question is, why is it that whenever Africans come together, Nigerians as an example, all they talk of is how to build roads, infrastructure, and uh, you know, basic things that are taken for granted in this part of the world. Why don't Africans think of how Africa can be a superpower, economic superpower in the world? Why doesn't Nigeria talk about how they can rule the world? Why are they so concerned? Okay. I, I, okay. So, I, I want... So, so, so let's, let's parse this question again. So the question is then, let's, can, can let's you... ask the question, let's ask the question, can Africa, can Africa take a leadership position in the world? Please, please include this in the, in the agenda for the New York Forum in Africa. <laughs> Africa, yes. So then let's ask, how is it that Africa can take more of a leadership position in the world? Uh, <laughs> I'm waiting for more silence. Leadership, I think, it's, uh, is in the DNA of people. And I think that there are many leaders, and African leaders, in the public and in the private sectors, who can definitely be leaders, especially now where you have a lack of leadership. Uh, I was even, this is a conversation we have quite often with my wife, I say, okay, who do you really admire today? Today, and in all areas. And you know, you have only very few names. Africa had, I hope that he will continue to, to live more years, but had an amazing leader with Nelson Mandela. And everybody is an icon, he's not even a leader. So I think Africa has definitely the opportunity to have more Nelson Mandela. And this has absolutely to be, you know, leadership is not something that you can just uh, decide. This is something that you can also uh, um, build and entertain and maintain. Uh, I have in mind one of my very dear friends 
who I will hope one day will come back to his continent and to his country, who is for me a great leader, and he could be a great African leader. This is my friend Tijan Tiam, who run Peru. He's from Ivory Coast, but I'm sure that many Tijan Tiam exist in the world. The only problem is to help them to exercise their leadership. So the answer is yes, Africa is not behind. Africa has many opportunities, but again, you should take your destiny in your hands and have a voice. And yes, the New York Forum will be a platform to give you a voice. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Yonela. I'm from South Africa, from an organization called... Could you be louder, please? <laughs> you can hold the mic. <laughs> okay. <laughs> My name is Yonela. I come from South Africa. I represent an organization called uh, the National Empowerment Fund. It's a developmental fin finance institution in South Africa. Um, my question uh, really is, um, every time we tend to speak to US investors, um, potentially you know, uh, trying to tell them about our projects, and, and what is happening in South Africa and the rest of Africa, you find that the perception is that um, Africa is behind, Africa is corrupt, and um, all these other uh, negative perceptions about Africa. Whereas you find that if you go to South Africa on the ground, there's lots of good work being done actually to alleviate corruption, to an extent that corruption is almost um, you know, something that we don't worry about anymore as South Africans. My question really is, um, do we, is, is the is US, um, I mean, in taking time to inform itself really about is there corruption or, you know, is the investment climate supportive uh, for investors or rather just, um, you know. Okay. So, first of all, corruption is everywhere. You should not, and we should stop to think that the only country or only continent where corruption exists is Africa. Corruption is in China, corruption is in Brazil, corruption is everywhere. Unfortunately, it's one of the big diseases of our century. And I think it will take times and times and times to eradicate. And corruption will be eradicated only thanks to great education, ethics, etc., etc. So, point number one. Point number two, I think when you have a good project, good people, the will to really implement and uh, a good return of investment of a potential project, investors will come. Carlos Slim, who was one of our key mentors of the New York Forum, who is the richest man in the world, has just invested a lot of money in Rwanda. Why? Because it was a good project, a good ecosystem, good interlocutor, and potentially a good return of investment. George Soros did the same in many other countries. In Morocco, you know, we, I think, His Excellency the Ambassador would know that much better than me, but I think it's today probably the first or the second African destination of foreign direct investment. Why? Because we built the ecosystem to attract and keep the trust and the confidence of the investors. And there are Americans uh, from Gulf countries, from every part of the world. So I don't think you should, you should be audacious. Come with good projects, good people, and you will find good investors. How then do we change the perception? Because part of this question is about the perception of Africa as a, the most corrupt place, as a place that isn't friendly to investment. How do we change that? Invite more people to come to visit you. Invite people here next year to meet with this great uh, reservoir of talents and when you will discuss with them in the corridors, they will see that Africa is not just about corrupted, uh, people who do not know how to read. And even when I was 15 years ago in some part of the world, I will not mention, and I was saying that I was born in Morocco, people thought that we were still living in cabins and working on camels. <laughs> and, and it's true. And so we need to communicate. Don't think that everybody knows where Gabon is. You know, many people in America, when I started to say, oh, we have the New York from Africa in Gabon, I said, but where is Gabon? Okay, so we are, we are because we need to open our doors as Africans, much more educated on global geography than, sorry, forgive me, than even Americans. You know, so I think we need to communicate 
to open our doors and to organize as many possibilities, as many opportunities as we can to have people visiting us, exchanging, dialoguing, talking. Don't spend all your time just on the virtual world with Facebook, Internet, Twitter. This will not help you. Thank you. So I'm going to exercise my interviewer's privilege and ask the last question. So I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about your advice. So this room is filled with people who are interested in Africa, who are interested in working in Africa, who are interested in doing exactly the sorts of things that you're talking about, making change, becoming the next generation of leaders. What advice do you have for the people in this room and what advice can they take back with them about how to do that? Be audacious. I think it's very important. Before coming in this room, one of the students came and told me, I was just there reading my notes, Tell me, Richard, can I ask you a question? Say yes. How and what should I do to connect with people? I told him, you know, this is in your DNA. So be audacious. I think this is very important. Be and develop your global culture. Even if you go working in May or June 2012 in a very specific industry, keep your eyes and your ears open to the other world. Even if you become a great specialist on private equity or on energy, let's see what is happening all over the place. I think it's very important. Global culture, be audacious. And last but not least, don't hesitate to start in small and medium business. The, you know, I think it's important. This is really where the energy is. This is where the innovation is. And I think when you have innovation plus entrepreneurship, this is what we call Startup Africa. Excellent. Well, I can't think of a better note to end on, so thank you very much. Thank it's you very much. It was a privilege to be here. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Wait, if you can hold. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yes. Sorry, sorry, sorry. sorry. I apologize. Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, I'm the ambassador of Morocco, and I couldn't resist taking the floor at least for one minute. <laughs> to say the following. First, that I'm extremely proud to belong to the same country that, to which uh, uh, Mr. Atias belongs. Uh, I'm very pleased because he can say something that I think, that, but I cannot say. <laughs> so in a certain way, we 